All right, Stacy, we are live. Okay. Thank you so much for taking out some time. My pleasure. Let's jump right in here. Um, tell us how you ended up getting the role of Ellie, G Ellie Gimbridge in Halloween. Gimbridge, Bridge. yes. <laughs> okay. Um, at the time, I was dating Perry King, who was living, because he had just separated from his wife, he was living with a makeup artist, a man named Ron Walter, who um, was the makeup artist uh, for The Last Convertible, the show, the miniseries for NBC that Perry and I met on. So Ron, um, you know, let Perry shack up with him while he was figuring out what he was doing. And Ron had already been cast, hired, not cast. He was a makeup artist. He was hired to be the makeup artist for Halloween 3. And he kept telling me, you know, they can't find the actress there. Looking, looking, looking. And it didn't, it didn't interest me because um, I'm not a big horror film. I don't like to go watch horror films. I get scared way too easily. <laughs> I was traumatized by seeing uh, The Exorcist when it came out. Literally, like, couldn't sleep for a month after. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it didn't really interest me that much. And then they were coming down to the wire and Ron said, you sure you're not interested? And I said, you know what, have them send me a script. And they sent me the script and I loved the part of Ellie. And I went in and I read for the part. And literally as I was coming home from the audition, the phone was ringing with them telling me you got the part. And this is because, I mean, that never happens. That was because they were shooting like in three days from then. <laughs> they literally were down to the wire and they could not find the actress. So um, I got the part and, you know, within 72 hours, I was on location wow. shooting. So, yeah. So it was That's just good. one of those, go figure. And, you know, for many years, it, it, it didn't do very well. Nobody saw it. I don't even know, you know, if it stayed in the movie theaters for more than 72 hours when it came out. <laughs> you know, and it was just one of those you chalk up to, okay, another one that nobody will see and whatever. And then it just wound up getting this cult following, which has been amazing. Yeah, and I was going to bring that up. I was going to say, what are your feelings on the fan base mm. that this film has today? I think it's phenomenal. I have to tell you, um, I love meeting the fans because the horror fans um, are really interesting, smart people. They're <laughs> not, you know, because I, as I said, I never went to watch them. But these people really get into it. They know all the lines for the movie. They know all of the other films and and, and they do their research and they're really cool, interesting people. And I love getting to meet them. So it's been an amazing, um, amazing experience. And I've been doing this for the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years, the last, you know, doing all these conventions and things. It's been fantastic. That's so Out fun. of the blue though, you know? And what were your feelings when you saw that, uh, that Michael Myers wasn't in the movie? I mean, did you... Were you familiar with the Halloween series? You know, I wasn't. So um, wasn't. I knew about Halloween 1. And I knew Jamie Lee Curtis because we used to take a dance class together. That's cool. So um, as I said, I really wasn't a fan because I, I would get too scared. Um, I, I Sometime while we were shooting, I managed to get a hold of Halloween 1 so I could watch it just to get a feel. I mean, but they are completely, as you know, better than I do. Because, <laughs> right, completely different films. So, um, and I think Halloween 1 is really good and really frigging scary. Um, <laughs> but, but what I like about our film is that there is not as much gratuitous violence and not as much gratuitous sex. I mean, there is that shower scene, which is a little bit gratuitous, but not totally. Halloween one and two, I think, you know, the girls running topless and, you know, it's a little, okay. <laughs> but, that's, but that's how movies were in the 70s. You know, people your age and younger don't realize, um, 
you know, in the 70s, there was a lot more nudity than there is today in, in films, a lot more. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that was, that was how it was done then. Was um, done. And what was it like working with Tom Atkins and Tommy Lee Wallace? Oh, okay. So, so I'm sure you've interviewed Tom Atkins, right? I actually haven't. I've been trying to. Oh, okay. Well, one he's, day. Okay. <laughs> he's, he's a wonderful man. He is a generous, um, no bullshit, no pretension actor, which is rare. <laughs> Let me tell you, <laughs> he's great. He's, he's really great. We, we had a lot of fun. I think uh, the, the love scene was, was one of the first scenes we did together. Really? And yeah, and, <laughs> you know, to wake up at six in the morning and it was freezing. And then they put this, you know, they have to put body makeup literally every square inch of your body. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and the sponges, those days they did with sponge and water. And it was always freezing cold water, you know, so that was bad enough. But then, you know, you got to be semi nude in front of these people you don't know. And then with this actor, you barely know. He made me feel very comfortable. I have to tell you, because oh, those cool. kind of things are never, um, never sexy. That's for sure. sure. <laughs> They're not hot and, he and heavy the way maybe they look. They're incredibly technical. So... Yeah, he was wonderful. And Tommy Lee Wallace, um, you know, he started out as a musician. Right. So um, he, he was incredibly open, open-minded, um, wanted us to give him a lot of feedback, wanted us to change lines if we felt the need to. That's cool. And, and, and all of that. And there's so many people who are really you know, by the book and they don't want you to change, you know, a comma on, on, on a script. And Tommy was very collaborative and that was great. And he was very, very easygoing. He's an incredibly mellow, uh, mellow guy. He was great. Great. That's awesome. What would you say was the most challenging aspect for you on the film? Uh, you know, I think the nude scene was, um, it was also, you know, there was, um, well, you don't know, we, we had a no nipple clause. Okay. So <laughs> it, just like what it sounds. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, the DP, Dean Cundy, who was great. And, and Tommy and Tommy Lee, everybody had to be very careful. Okay. So, you know, kiss her one quarter of an inch to the left, but no, no, no wait. You know, it was so technical because they couldn't show my nipple they could only show this it was and and you know and it's supposed to convey a certain sensuality and sexuality and lust and you know when people are measuring you know and they're the the cameraman's doing it you know the um they're <laughs> doing the lighting and you know they got to measure from here to here and they got to make sure they get this but not that and pretty crazy it's pretty crazy so um i guess if i had let them you know full monty it wouldn't have mattered it would have been easier but sure. because i i had this no nipple clause you know they had to shoot around it was crazy that's all right yeah. that's all right and what was it like shooting your scene when you got unmasked as a robot that was uh how was that yeah. You know, that, the, the part where my head gets cut off and goes flying and my arm, that was to me the most interesting thing that we filmed because of the way they did it. Now today, you know, 30 years later, 35 years later, they would do it completely differently. But they were so inventive because they had to be. They didn't have green screen in those days. They didn't have any of this. So what they had done was, you know, first before we even started shooting, I had to go to Don Post and they did a, a death mask, you know, so they had my head and they could paint it and, you know, make it look like me. And then there was this body double uh, actress 
um, stand-in who was exactly my size, wearing the same clothes I was wearing for the whole last part of the film, which yeah. was, you know, it was a couple of weeks of shooting in the same stupid jeans and sweater <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the thing around my neck. And um, they built a platform and they put grass and dirt, you know, and everything over it. So it looked like the outdoors where my head goes flying. Sure. And uh, the platform was big enough for a slim body to get into. And I slipped under it and there was a hole like a, like a whack-a-mole for my head to come up. And then they mm. covered the dirt all around it, you know, in the grass. And then my body double, who, as I said, was exactly my size, wearing the same clothes I'd been used to seeing, was a few feet away with her head down a hole and her body and the part covered up to here so you could only see her neck and the body lying there. And I'll tell you, that was so cool because I would look over, you know, where my <laughs> body was and I swear it looked like it was me, <laughs> you know, I was like, how did this happen? And it, you know, that's, that's the fun of filmmaking that they could do something like that in those days. It was so creative, you know, to think of a way to make something like that. Whereas today it's all digital, it's kind of cheating. You know, there they really used creativity in a different way. That's so, cool. um, yeah, so that was really cool. That was, a, that was fun. So speaking of robots, mm. tell us about how you originally cast as the infamous six replicant in Blade Runner. Uh, I read something online. Oh, uh, yeah. So um, there was an actress, is uh, she's now a casting director, I believe, a woman named Nina Axelrod, who was tall blonde, and she heard about um, uh, Blade Runner and she was desperate to play the lead character and um, I guess my agent had told me about the part of Pris the part that Daryl Hannah wound up doing yeah. so I wound up reading for I, I can't remember if it was Mike Fenton whoever the casting director was anyway it wound up coming down to two pairs of actresses one for, uh, I can't remember the, the lead character's name, um, and that was Nina, and I would be Pris. Uh, you know, I was the petite dark, now I'm blonde, um, and, <laughs> and Nina. And then there was Sean Young and Daryl Hannah as the other couple, right? The dark and the blonde. Sure. And we did full, and I mean full, 35 millimeter, full hair, full makeup, full lighting, full, full, you know, cinematography, screen tests. I mean, we were there all night on, I think it was the Warner Brothers lot, all night, like for two days doing these screen tests. Wow. And um, I did not get the part and I was really bummed because Ridley Scott thought I would not, I was, I'm tiny, you know, he didn't think I could conceivably beat up Harrison Ford. Yeah. Um, and he's right, you know, I mean, I'm little and Daryl was, you know, was a much bigger girl. Um, but then this part came up, they liked me and my look. And so there was a character named Mary, who was apparently in the book um, about of the Blade Runner. And then they offered me this part. Um, and it was an amazing part. I had this dying scene, I was going to be one of the replicants as was the character Pris, a replicant. Right. So I was gonna be one of these replicants and there was this great scene where I stick my hand in a pot of boiling eggs and you know, cause the replicants couldn't feel things. And, couldn't feel and then right. she has this great dying scene. And then, um, then the actor strike happened and I got a phone call from Michael Dealey, the producer saying, you know, oh darling, we're way over budget and we haven't gotten to shoot you yet. And I'm, so terribly sorry, but we're gonna have to cut you out of the film. I was, I was, I was heartbroken. And I had been on the set for like a month, you know, rehearsing and doing all the makeup and all the hair and, you know, for this character of Mary and hanging mm. out with Rutger Hauer and Daryl and, you know, all these people. And, 
you know, all these little missed opportunities, but that's how life goes, right? <laughs> that's all right. It's still a cool yeah. story. Yeah. And then I got um, to be part of it anyway. Yeah. And then in um, in Yellowbeard, what was it like working with the Monty Python gang <laughs> and Cheech and Chong? That must have been a riot. It was not only a riot, it was, it was my favorite experience of all the movies I made put together. Really? Only because, you know, Peter Cook was one of the writers of it. He and I wound up having this little thing, well, not <laughs> a little thing, big thing. And, um, you know, these brilliant, and I say brilliant comic minds. And, you know, we were all smoking dope together and laughing and improvising. And, drinking, you know, beer and, and uh, you know, had the greatest time. And um, it, was, it was extraordinary. You know, David Bowie came to the set. We almost died at the hands of David Bowie, um, who, got, <laughs> who was very, very high. And um, Martin Hewitt, you know, who played the, the, the lead in sure. it, was just, you know, going insane because David Bowie, his big idol was there. And I'm like, eh, I wasn't, you know, into David Bowie's mu music. Now I love his music, but um, we all wound up getting in this Jeep. David Bowie was driving like a madman. And we all went, oh my, I was in the back with Peter and Madeline Kahn. And we went, we're gonna get fucking killed here. Stop <laughs> the car, We let us out. And we got out and, and Graham, Chapman and, um, and, and, De and Martin Hewitt stayed in the car. They wound up having an accident and oh Graham God. broke his arm. So it was, you know, we were, we were not too far off, <laughs> but it was, it was incredible. It was an incredible experience, really, really. That's amazing. That's really cool. Yeah. And um, let's see. So what was it also like working with uh, with Tony Danza and Danny DeVito oh. and the orangutans and going in. Oh. Such well, a fun movie. Let's start with the monkeys. They were very smelly. <laughs> and I had to <laughs> and I had to carry the little one, you know, for for a good portion of the end of the film. Sure. And this sweaty, I mean they would sweat and they were so stinky. This sweaty <laughs> but and kind of itchy because the hair wasn't it's not like soft hair it's kind of coarse sure. um i'm carrying this this ape you know for like i don't know hours and hours and i'd have to hold them they were very sweet though but um you know i like to joke that they got treated and paid better than we all did but <laughs> you know, which they did kind of you know they had their own trailer they did pretty well i had the biggest crush on tony danza he knew it we had fun um, Danny DeVito, um, I don't think he liked me for some reason. I don't know. He, <laughs> you know, in the scene where we had to shove the pie in each other's faces, he seemed a little too happy to do that to me. He liked and, that um, a little too much, huh? <laughs> I don't, I don't know what it was, but, um, and Jessica Walter and I, you know, she played my mom in three different shows and she and I became very, very close. She is incredibly funny. This is long before Arrested Development. Right. She, she would make me crack up, you know, when, when it was uh, my time on camera and she was off screen and, you know, they'd have to reshoot and reshoot because she'd crack me up, you know, she was, <laughs> she was great, so, yeah. That's fun. Yeah. And what was it like working with, um, with Woody Allen uh, on Bullets Over mm. Broadway? It must have been incredible. Well, we worked together a few times. You know, we, we met doing Annie Hall and we worked together on that. And, right. and we wound up dating for a couple of years. And then right. uh, we, we did um, Deconstructing Harry, which I was cut from, and then Celebrity, which I was cut from, Bullets Over Broadway, but, but was before those two. And... Um, and it was great. I mean, you know, we know each other, so we're friendly. We're still friendly to this day. So we had a very easy, fun working relationship. And that was, that was great. Because I wasn't intimidated by him because I've known him for so long. That's cool. You know? Yeah. He's That's really amazing. Cool. Yeah. And you're also an author, I saw. 
you have a um, book yeah 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 and i, I guess tell us about that side of you and kind of what else you've been up to okay well i uh, this was um this was a, a relationship book it's called you can't afford to break up how an empty wallet and a dirty mind can save your marriage um and uh it was written, you know, before around 2008 when with the economy was kind of turning down, kind of is still now. Um, and uh, it was about a way to keep, I wrote it with a psychologist friend, how to keep your marriage spicy, how to keep it alive, how to, um, how to use those, those moments that can be incredibly difficult and scary, how to use them to infuse your marriage in a more fun, playful, sexy way. So, um, you know, I did that. And then I went back to school and I have been working as a substance abuse counselor for four and a half years now. Really? So, yeah. And I work, um, I work with mentally ill, chemically addicted. Now I'm working at a place with just women who are, um, most of them are um, opioid addicts and, you know, they're fighting to regain custody of their kids. And, um, my dad died from heroin, a heroin, heroin overdose when I was 17. So for me, this is a way to give back, really, sure. um, and help. Uh, my best friend's stepson literally yesterday on Father's Day died from an overdose. Um, you know, it's, it's an epidemic. It's, it's very scary what's going on. Um, especially now, I mean, I did my share of drugs. Um, but today it's so different and the fentanyl that's being put in everything. And I mean, everything, including weed, you know, things that would be totally innocuous, you know, you can, you can die from. So you got to be super careful of that. And, um, and it breaks my heart, you know, people's lives are just destroyed because of these things. That's a hard job. So that's what I've been doing. And it's, uh, you know, like a mission for me in a way. Wow. Well, that's incredible. Listen, Stacey, I really appreciate every, you know, the time you took out. That's all the questions I have. <laughs> Well, those so, are great, great questions, Mike. Well, thank so, you. I do appreciate yeah. it. It's been a real pleasure. Okay. It's and, been a pleasure uh, I'll talking. I'll get this posted and I'll get it sent over to you. You can awesome. take a look. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Good luck. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Take Have a great care. night. All right. Have a good one.